and I'd like to introduce Ken Burns, who will introduce our session for today. Thank you. Welcome to you all. Uh, actually, John and I co-facilitate this course, but we had a speaker who was lined up to give this talk who withdrew at the last moment because of a family problem. And John heroically has <laughs> volunteered to give the talk, so I agreed to introduce him. John, as you all know, is a retired professor in the biology department here at the University of Florida, where he was an expert on spiders. Is that arachnidology or something like that? <laughs> Arachnology. Yeah, okay. And uh, he's really, uh, the, the talk he's going to give is on the 2021 Nobel Prize in Economics, which had to do with uh, labor uh, and, and paying for labor, et cetera. Uh, it, I don't know what John's background is in this area, but uh, I would say the closest he may have come was that he served as the chair of the Alachua County uh, Democratic Party and I'm sure he had all sorts of economical theories, uh, which uh, which he could apply uh, to this topic. So, as uh, Ed McMahon used to say on the Carson Show, "Here's John." And it's interesting. Um, I grew up called Johnny, so his Johnny would be appropriate too. I dropped that when I went to college. Um, let me tell you, I want to go a little bit into the history of this course because um, it's been 10 years. Uh, I guess this is the 11th year of this course. And I originally uh, thought it up when I was uh, uh, hit with all the Nobel prizes that are announced the first week of October of each year. And I always said to myself, you know, I really should, uh, know more about this, and but I, I, I told my daughter, I, I just was lazy. And so I said, let me get the experts to tell me about the significance of each of the Nobel Prizes. Um, and we have all these experts at the University of Florida. So I started this course and we did very well. Um, as some of you remember Harold Hansen, was it Harold? Yeah, who was a vice president and an expert uh, Norwegian poetry, and the winner in 2011 uh, was a, a, a Swede, an, uh, a Swedish poet, and he in his early 90s came and gave a talk on uh, Swedish and Norwegian poetry. So that began the whole process. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I started it is I realized uh, uh, that it wasn't, it, it I was interested in the Nobel laureates themselves and also the significance of the work they did. And so some of the people who spoke were office mates of the Nobel laureate, others were students of a Nobel laureate, others just loved the work of a Nobel laureate. Lauren Groff, a novelist in town, gave a talk on, uh, on um, Alice Munro, who was the first, almost the only uh, literature winner for short stories of all things. Usually they were novels and this sort of thing. So it was an exciting time to pull together this sort of information. This year in, uh, has been a little bit frustrating. Uh, uh, we've had some technical sound problems and and one of the talks, I won't mention names, was at least to me incoherent. So I, I uh, uh, was very concerned that we lost our speaker in economics, of which I know very little. Um, even uh, I, I know more about the labor movement than about economics. However, I decided I didn't want to throw in the towel because I, I got to be interested in the significance of each of these uh, uh, of these prizes. And so I decided to do what I would do if I had the more initiative in my 
itself, and that is to explore the economics prize. And what I'm going to give you today is basically um, the significance of the economics prize, as well as a little of its history, through the creative works of others, including some wonderful interviews with, the, with all three of the laureates this year. And uh, so it's really not me uh, becoming an expert in economics. It's uh, basically um, harvesting the wisdom uh, and sometimes the sarcasm of others uh, that I'm gonna put together today and, and give you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, it will be a PowerPoint with uh, some interesting videos. Um, this is the name of the prize. It's not the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. It's the Sphergus Sreeksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. And um, a little bit about this. This is uh, Nobel came up with five prizes, as you know, and uh, on the 300th anniversary of the Swedish, Sweden's Central Bank, they established uh, an additional Nobel they proposed to, to the Nobel Foundation that they would fund themselves, uh, the bank would, as you can see here. It's based on a donation received by the foundation. Uh, some of the Known recipients uh, that you might have heard of is Paul Friedman, uh, Paul Krugman, I mean Milton Friedman, and Paul Krugman, who writes a column for the New York Times, and John F. Nash, who was a uh, uh, a film was made, uh, and some of you will remember the name of it, and I should have checked the Wonderful Mind or something to that effect, which was really an interesting. Uh, interesting film. So I was going to uh, give you a little background on the Nobel Prize. And this, as I point out at the bottom, is, uh, is a bit controversial. And so here's a snarky examination by a, uh, a man by the name of Yanis Varoufakas. And he uh, refers to the Nobel Prizes of last year a little bit in this, but he gives a broad view. So we're going to watch this. One year before he died in 1896, Alfred Nobel stated in his will that a large part of his inheritance should fund a yearly prize awarded to persons who made exceptional contributions to the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. As you might have noticed, Nobel himself did not mention a prize for economic sciences. What's more, while these prizes are known as the Nobel Prize in Physics, Chemistry, etc., the Prize for Economic Sciences is actually known as the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. Is it therefore not a real Nobel Prize? Keep watching this video to find out. On first inspection, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences looks a lot like the other Nobel Prizes. It is announced at the same time as all the other prizes. The winners are featured on the official Nobel Prize website, along with the other winners, and the prize is awarded at the same event as the Physics, Chemistry, Medicine and Peace Prizes in Stockholm, Sweden. So then, why is there still any doubt that this is a real Nobel Prize? To understand this story, we first must go back to 1888, the year when a French newspaper published an obituary that read, the merchant of death is dead, referring to Alfred Nobel, who was not only the inventor of dynamite, but also the owner of more than 90 web companies. However, the catch was that Alfred Nobel was not dead at all. The newspaper had mistaken his dead brother for the man himself. And when Mr. Nobel read the article, he was so appalled at the thought of being remembered as the merchant of death that he changed his will 
so that his fortune would be used to create a series of prizes awarded to those who confer the greatest benefits on mankind in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. Notice that the only prize that was not mentioned in his will is the one in economic sciences. This prize was established much later in 1968, to be exact, when the Swedish Central Bank committed to funding it. And that is why it's called the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel instead. At the time, the Swedish Central Bank, like many others around the world, was in a struggle to gain independence from the government. A Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences would establish once and for all that economics was a proper science, just like physics, chemistry and medicine. Hence, it makes sense that the central bank is not controlled by politicians, but rather by experts, right? Now, we don't know if this was indeed why the prize was created, but it was really convenient for the Riksbank at the time, that is for sure. Then again, it was also just the 300th anniversary of the bank and their reasons for establishing the price could be far more altruistic. For example, it could be argued that if there is a need for any science to up its game and save humanity, it is economics. After all, while the Nobel was awarded for the discovery of a tetanus vaccine, no vaccine to poverty has yet been discovered. Furthermore, there is a clear correlation between which countries do well economically and how many Nobel Prize winners are produced. Economic success allows all sciences to flourish. Hence, it makes sense for there to be an extra motivation for economists to do well in the form of a Nobel Prize. Finally, it could be said that the winners in auction theory, which I talked about in the previous two videos of this mini-series, have made very tangible contributions to the progress of humanity. After all, they have invented auction formats that saved governments billions of dollars that could be used on helping people. Thus, it could be said that they have made a contribution that is just as, if not more important than, say, the physics prize winners of 2020, which have made some additional discoveries about black holes. So why then is the prize still so controversial? One question that is often asked is, what about mathematics, engineering, biology, or computer science? Aren't they just as important as economics? To that question, the Nobel Prize Committee has decided to keep the original five prizes plus the economic prize and not to add any more new prizes. It seems a bit arbitrary to allow for the economics prize, but not for the other ones. A more scathing criticism comes from Peter Nobel, one of the descendants of Alfred Nobel. Peter has said that his great-great-uncle, Alfred, despised people who cared more about profits than society's well-being. Given that profits, returns, income, or GDP are generally the main variables of interest for economists, Peter has said, among other things, that there is nothing to indicate that Alfred Nobel would have wanted such a prize. Also, he said, the prize has often been awarded to stock market speculators, which does not reflect Alfred Nobel's spirit of improving the human condition. And finally, he said, the economics prize is nothing more than a PR coup by economists to improve their reputation. Another argument that is often heard is that the contributions of social scientists like economists are often much more ambiguous than those of the so-called hard sciences, such as physics, chemistry, and medicine. These prizes have gone to great inventors, such as those who invented the techniques to edit DNA and the hepatitis C virus this year. In contrast, the prize in economic sciences has often gone to economists who have added well-known phenomena, such as change, technological innovation, human behavior, and market power to abstract economic models, or to economists who have contributed to the empirical analysis of poverty, asset prices, and economic governance. These are far less obvious improvements to the human condition. But while I think there is some truth to that argument, there is also a Nobel Prize for literature and one for peace. Especially that last one has been far more controversial than the economics prize. 
Also, there is some merit to the argument that establishing the Nobel Prize in economics was a PR stunt with political motivations. However, even if it was, that is water under the bridge. The prize has now been well established, and sure, while there is a valid case to be made for more sciences to receive a Nobel Prize, that doesn't mean that the economics prize is a fake Nobel Prize. Furthermore, even if there are no Nobel Prizes in other fields, there are other highest honors for them that basically serve the same purpose, such as the Fields Medal in Mathematics and the Turing Prize in Computer Science. And given that the Nobel Institute itself considers it a proper Nobel Prize and treats its winners the same as all the others, I think it's clear that the Economic Nobel Prize is here to stay and even though it will remain the odd one out because of its name and history, it is for all practical purposes a real Nobel Prize. So with the case being closed for the economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel Prize being a proper Nobel Prize, that closes our mini-series on the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. What do you think? Have I made the case convincingly? Let me know in the comments. And if you haven't done so already, check out both previous videos on the 1996 and 2020 prizes in auction theory. Finally, if you are interested in more of this type of content, then subscribe to the channel, and that really helps me out a lot. Okay, uh, so there's always in these uh, YouTube uh, derived uh, videos, there'll be uh, some little advertising and, and little, uh, little comments of that sort, but I thought it gave really a pretty accurate history uh, of the economics prizes as well as the prizes in general. And we'll talk more about the history of the Nobel Prize next week. Um, so uh, these are the three laureates for 2021. Now, just to comment on the previous uh, video, they spoke about the 2020 prize, which was given to two, two laureates or two winners on auctions. And the auctions they were talking about, uh, especially the very expensive ones, auctioning uh, radio frequencies and how governments could maximize the benefits to both uh, controlling uh, radio and television and uh, electronic frequencies. So you may want to go back there because it's a fascinating story and follow those, um, those previous uh, videos. This year, three people won the economics prize. Um, as it says here, half of the prize, and the prize this year was approximately $1 million, 10,000 Swedish krona, um, uh, 10 million, I mean, Swedish krona, uh, $1 million. Uh, David Card for his empirical contributions to labor economics. And the other half jointly to Joshua Angrist and Guido Imbens for their methodological contribution to the analysis of causal relationships. And so we're going to be looking at both these, uh, these two basic areas and uh, in, their own, in their own words. So first um, we will look at um, the significance of the works of all three here. Uh, this was sponsored by a group called public.com, also by a, um, a YouTube. And um, then we will um, talk about each of them and allow them to talk about their prizes individually. The 2021 Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel was awarded to these three gentlemen, David Card for his empirical contributions to labour economics, as well as Joshua Angrist and Guido Imbens for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. Causal relationships, not casual relationships. Nerdy economists certainly aren't winning any awards for those, but these are perhaps even more interesting. The fact that this year's was a joint prize with two groups being recognised for their contributions to the field of economics goes to show just how consequential their work really has been. Labour economics is something that impacts all of us directly, but perhaps this has never been more apparent than right now in the midst of a global pandemic, with hundreds of countries all trying to put their economies back on track without causing greater issues down the road. So was this all just a coincidence? No, not really, no. 
In recent years, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has actually been specifically targeting academic work that has direct applications in modern economies. An example of this was the winners that we explored last year, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson, whose contributions to auction theory are actually being put to good use as we speak, linking the best buyers with sellers in some of the most complex transactions in the world. This focus on practical economic applications means that these awards are a whole lot more than some self-congratulatory academic pomp fest. They are genuinely an insight into new and creative ways that some of the greatest minds ever are changing the world around us. It also means that long-held economic opinions that most economists simply assume to be self-evident are being challenged. The work of this year's winners actually changed my mind on an economic function that I've spoken about pretty openly in a lot of my videos. So this will be a great chance to have some of the most brilliant economists in the world set the record straight for both you and I, but I'm getting ahead of myself. To truly appreciate the Nobel Prize and the contributions its recipients make, we need to, as always, understand a few specific things. So, how does one actually qualify to win a Nobel Prize? What did this year's winners contribute to the field of economics to win their prize? And how are their academic advances actually being put to good use in the real world? This video is brought to you by Public.com, Internet's premier investing platform, one that helps you become a better investor. Public puts investors first. Unlike other commission-free trading apps, Public does not sell your trades to market makers or take commissions from payment for order flow, also known as PFOF. Public works for you, not trading firms. The app lets you see what market trends that your friends, co-workers, as well as industry thought leaders are following. You can also participate in live Q&A sessions called Town Halls with public company CEOs, allowing you to ask questions just like a Wall Street analyst. Get between $3 to $100 in free stock when you sign up at public.com slash EE and fund your account today. Just use your phone's camera app to scan the QR code on screen, or if you're watching on your phone, feel free to click the link in the video description below. The Nobel Prize was created by Alfred Nobel, a Swedish chemist and industrialist who was best known at the time for stabilizing an incredibly reactive compound called nitroglycerine. By basically combining this chemical with clay, it became much easier to handle while still maintaining its explosive potential. What he had invented was dynamite, literally. Now, in the interest of not being put on a watch list, that's all I'm going to say about that. Alfred Nobel immediately saw the destructive potential of his invention. Sure, it had industrial applications like mining and controlled demolitions, but let's be real, it was going to be used in war. This fact haunted the scientist, which is why upon his death in 1896, he bequeathed the vast majority of his assets to create a foundation which would award people who had made the greatest contributions to humanity in five distinct fields. Physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. Now, you might notice something's missing here. Maths, maybe. We have the Fields Medal, which is basically the same thing, just a lot less prize money. But more specifically, there's no economics. Economics as a separate academic discipline wasn't really a thing until the mid-19th century. And even then, most people saw it as a combination of political science, business, and finance. It really wasn't until the Great Depression and the rise of people like Keynes and Friedman that economics became the topic of dinner table conversations around the world. Nevertheless, it still had the potential to do a lot of good. Being able to efficiently and effectively allocate resources has been instrumental in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of absolute poverty over just the last five decades. Obviously, I might be a little bit biased here, but advances in economic theory can do just as much good for humanity as advancements in all of these other fields. Now, the Central Bank of Sweden thought so too. That's why in 1968, it partnered with the Nobel Foundation to create the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in honour of Alfred Nobel, the sixth Nobel Prize. Since then, it has been awarded every year at the same time as all of these other prizes are given out. The recipients are awarded the same solid medal and they share in the same prize money. Although the economists have their cut provided by the Swedish Central Bank, not the Nobel Foundation. This prize money is no joke. This year's prize was 10 million Swedish krona, or about the equivalent of 1 million American dollars. Typically, the people that win these awards are already quite wealthy in their own right. Certain more controversial recipients were worth tens of millions of dollars when receiving their awards, so the social expectation was that this prize money would get donated, which it has been, more often than not. But of course, to some career academics, this is a life-changing amount of cash, and most people don't begrudge these individuals hanging on to the money for themselves. Now, you might say, well, but Mr. Economics Man, the real gift is being recognised as a Nobel laureate. 
you can make much more money just by leveraging the notoriety that gives you, and you would be absolutely right, mostly. The reason that I mentioned the money at all is that the initial award criteria was that these prizes would be given to individuals or institutions that had had greatest impact on their respective field in the year preceding the award. So if I wanted to win the Nobel Prize for 2022, I would need to publish my research before the end of 2021. While this system made sense in theory and it made for very exciting competition, the unfortunate reality is that academia is not like sport or the performing arts where a contribution's merit is immediately verifiable and appreciable. This caused some embarrassments with awards being given to people who really shouldn't have received it, like the Portuguese neurologist who won the award for his pioneering research in lobotomies, and Johannes Fibiger, who won the award for discovering a parasite that apparently caused cancer. Of course, the peer review process later showed that these theories were completely unfounded, but by then, the winners had already walked away with their honours and their prize money. It's because of this that the preceding year rule has mostly been abolished in favour of recognising contributions that have stood the test of time, and even more importantly, actually being used in practical applications outside of theoretical settings where disclaimers like ceteris paribus and ignore air friction can't save you. So this brings us along to this year's winners in the field of economics, who have exemplified this application over theory approach to generate some insights that could fundamentally change the way that we work. Labor is one of the factors of production, alongside land and capital. The theory is, to make anything, you need some combination of these three factors. They're not always equal, but you always need at least a little bit of each. Labor is the unique variable here, because almost all of us have access to an equal amount of it by default. We are one person and we can do the work of one person, whereas one person can own a lot of land and a lot of capital while others own none. This has made labour, more commonly called jobs, a major factor in people's lives, determining everything from where they live to who they vote for. Now, despite its importance, most economists simplify labour's role in the economy as just another good or service. As such, they assume that there is a negative relationship between wages and employment. If you take a step back and think about it, this makes perfect sense. Wages are just the price that a business pays for a set quantity and quality of labour, and employment rates are a function of demand for that labour. Even people with the most elementary understanding of economics know that as the price of something increases, the demand for that good or service decreases because less people are willing and able to pay the higher price for that item. This has led many to assume that raising minimum wages would do more harm than good because it would force employers to cut back on staffing in an attempt to maintain business profitability. By this logic, the reverse is so true. By reducing the minimum wage, it makes it cheaper for businesses to employ people, therefore they will employ more of them. Some infamous reports have actually called for establishing a $0 minimum wage because by this logic, it would lead to zero unemployment. Even the laziest of staff members would be worth having around if the business only needed to pay them 15 cents an hour. Now, despite the huge social problems this would cause, there is one other more immediate issue. It just doesn't work. Remember when I said at the beginning of the video that the Nobel Prize for Economics was increasingly being awarded to economists that emphasise practical applications and experimentations in their research? Well, this is how our first laureate won their prize. David Card is most famous for a paper he co-authored in 1994, which found no indication that the rising minimum wage reduced employment. He did this by studying fast food workers at major chains in New Jersey after the state raised its minimum wage from $4.25 an hour to $5.05 an hour in 1992. He then compared employment numbers in these restaurants to restaurants from the same chains just over the border in eastern Pennsylvania, where the minimum wage had not been altered. If the traditional economic theory was correct, then employment levels in New Jersey should have fallen as they needed to cut hours to compensate for the increased cost of labour. In reality, the opposite happened. Employment in New Jersey actually increased relative to eastern Pennsylvania. It's important to note that the study didn't actually suggest that increasing the minimum wage would increase employment. It instead was trying to prove that the minimum wage had no impact on employment, so even no relative change would have been a positive outcome for this study. The paper itself also didn't actually set out to explain why this was happening. It was instead trying to show if there was or was not a relationship between these two variables. It did inspire follow-up research though, that pointed to higher disposable incomes increasing aggregate demand in local areas. In general, employing people is expensive and difficult. Employers only do it if they absolutely need to. And if they absolutely need to employ someone because 
let's say more people are eating out thanks to their new higher salaries, then within reason, an extra dollar an hour in staff costs isn't going to be the make or break on that hiring decision. Card followed this paper up with a similar study on the labour supply side of this equation. He did this by studying the Mariel boat lift of 1980, which brought thousands of Cuban immigrants fleeing communism into the United States. See if you can answer this question. What happens to wages and unemployment when a city like Miami sees a 7% increase in labor force, made up primarily of unskilled laborers, mind you? A reasonable expectation would be that these ex-workers would compete with existing workers or just not be able to find jobs at all, which would simultaneously increase unemployment and lower wages. But it didn't. Again, the paper itself didn't actually cover the why. It was more concerned about proving or rather disproving that this relationship actually existed. These papers, along with a series of other research papers published by Card and his peers, have had drastic impacts on the way that economists understand labour market dynamics. These real-world studies are now having real-world impacts on policy decisions. Now, these papers, as impressive as they might be, would not have been possible if it were not for the work of the other two winners of this year's prize, Joshua Angrist and Guido Imbens, who both shared 50% of the prize, with the remaining 50% having been claimed by David Card. They all got their own gold medal, though, so that's nice. These two won their award for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. In plain English, economists around the 1990s had a real problem of lying with statistics. They had gotten their hands on computers that were powerful enough to crunch huge data sets and were drawing relationships everywhere and anywhere. The problem with these relationships was that correlation doesn't equal causation. The famous example of this is that ice cream sales are highly correlated with drownings. Despite this correlation, ice cream does not drown people and that have been drowned are not going to be hungry for ice cream. Rather, it is a third variable, a hot day, which causes both of these. On a hot day, people are more likely to go swimming and more likely to eat ice cream. This is an obvious example, but when it comes to economics, finding these hidden third factors can be extremely difficult, but it's not impossible. I actually got called out for my video exploring why cold countries are richer than hot countries because I concluded this correlation was not spurious as it did not have some hidden third variable. A lot of people rightfully asked how I knew that given a hidden third variable would be, well, hidden. This is where instrumental variables estimation comes in, which sounds really scary because it kind of is. I'm not going to lie to you on this one, guys. This is an advanced statistical method which aims to find causality not just correlation, but it's actually not too difficult to understand the theory behind it. The best example of this was one of Angris' early papers on the relationship between lifetime earnings and military service. Angris wanted to find out if the experience of serving in the military caused lower lifetime earnings because of factors like PTSD or required injuries. The problem was that there were hidden variables that had a direct impact on both the independent and dependent variables in this study. Now, some of these could be controlled for. For example, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to join the military and are also more likely to have lower lifetime incomes. But that's not the fault of military service. That's just the inherent relationship between being born wealthy and living wealthy. The researchers knew this factor and could easily adjust for it. But what about variables that can't be controlled for? Someone that hates the idea of working a professional nine to five job is also going to be more likely to join the military and also going to tend to have lower lifetime earnings. Again, this isn't the fault of the military. This is a personality trait that would have impacted their career earnings regardless of if they decided to join the military or not. The problem is that data pertaining to people's opinions on professional working environments is a lot harder to collect and therefore a lot harder to control for. Angra's solution to this was to use the data of conscripts from the Vietnam War. The theory was that since conscripts did not willingly volunteer to be part of the military, they would be devoid of the hidden variables that willing volunteers would have had, which could impact both earnings and military service. This allowed Angris to just look at how military service affected earnings and isolation, as in how much does military service cause a fall in income. The results were that conscripted veterans earned just over $400 a year less than their peers who were not conscripted, a pretty significant sum back in the 1970s. I only use this example because it is one of the easier ones to understand, but both Angris and Gimbens have had massive contributions towards the responsible use of data in economics. 
the practical applications of the research these three gentlemen have conducted over their careers cannot be overstated. It will continue to have very real impacts on the way that we formulate labour laws, deal with immigration and conduct research on these issues well into the future. So congratulations to them all and their fellow laureates who I'm sure have made equally consequential contributions towards their respective fields. This video was made possible by public. In addition to being a commission-free broker, no more ads, thank you. Um, I thought that was very interesting. There's several things I'd like to talk about, but I would like to ask you as a group to tell me what accent that announcer had. I can't quite figure it out. It's sort of a cross between Australian and uh, Valley Girl or something. I don't know. Okay, Edward, uh, I, I'm now going to look at each of the winners because, uh, and, and hear in their own words, uh, their perspective. The first one is David Edward Card, who won half the million dollars. He's a Canadian American and born in 1956. Um, and he had a colleague incidentally, the name of I think uh, Kruger at Princeton, who unfortunately died the year, uh, a, a couple of years ago and would have clearly shared uh, uh, the prize somehow with David Edward Card. Let me uh, just put a footnote here that uh, there's a regular, no more than three people can be awarded uh, in each of the categories. No more than three people can be awarded uh, a Nobel Prize. And, and we'll talk about that a little later. <clears throat> anyway, oh yes, Alan Kruger and uh, was his colleague, unfortunately died. And, uh, and David Card said for sure he would have had uh, equal standing in this. Um, so it, in the video, we heard the, the minimum wage situation in New Jersey and then on immigration, um, that uh, economic impact of new immigrants is minimal. Uh, these are two very controversial issues uh, in contemporary economics and in contemporary policy making. Um, and so that is very interesting. Uh, he's presently at the University of California at Berkeley. So let's hear from David Carr. Economics is the study of the real world and this year's Nobel Prize in economics recognized the efforts to change behaviors to influence that. The Royal Swedish Academy of Science, to give it its proper title, awarded the Nobel jointly to David Card for his work on developing natural experiments and to Joshua Angrist and Guido Imben for their work on analyzing causal relationships. Professor Card found out about the Nobel Prize while he was still up and about. It was in the middle of the night or very early in the morning and he was wearing his pajamas. The Nobel Prize uh, was tweeted a photo taken by Professor Card's wife. The Royal Academy, Swedish Academy, said he won his work for, which in their words, analyzed the labor market effects of minimum wage, immigration, education, and challenged conventional wisdom, leading to new analysis and additional insights. The Nobel Prize winning economist David Card. Congratulations, Professor. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a moment, isn't it, when they, they ring you up. Do you have any idea that you might be up for it this year? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I actually thought a, an old friend of mine was a, playing a prank. Really? What, you didn't believe yeah. initially? <laughs> well, you know, Lars from Sweden. I mean, what, what am I supposed to believe? <laughs> <laughs> Lars from Sweden and you won the Nobel and the checks in the mail. All right, let's talk about the work you've done. It's really, it's, I mean, this isn't highfalutin stuff that you've been working on. It is real world economics of immigration and minimum wage and those sorts of things that are political hot potatoes. For instance, let's talk minimum wage. Uh, I want you to listen to Senator Thune and settle this issue once and for all of the effect on minimum wage on business. Here's the Senator. So two of my brothers worked at filling stations. My sister waited tables. My other brother worked at our big local attraction, which was the Pioneer Auto Show. And as I said, I, I cooked at the Star Family Restaurant. All of those businesses, all of those businesses work with very narrow margins. And if you take a $15 minimum wage 
And I will tell you right now in South Dakota, the minimum wage, and our state sets it, which is frankly where I think it should be done. Our state has a $9.45, $9.45 minimum wage. What you're essentially telling uh, those businesses in South Dakota that I just mentioned, that you're going to increase the amount of money that they have to pay their workers by over 50%, 50% increase in the wages that they would pay. Well, what does that do? Um, obviously, it puts a lot of them out of business, but it also raises the cost of everything else. That's got to get passed on. So, Professor, once and for all, does the minimum wage, does raising the minimum wage cost jobs? Um, in the study that I did, which was 30 years ago and uh, looked at a substantially smaller increase, it was an increase from $4.25 to $5.05, so um, only a, a just under 30% increase. In that particular case, there was uh, no effect on employment. Subsequent studies that have been done by other researchers um, looking at a wide variety of um, uh, minimum wage increases in the U.S. Uh, and some in other countries like the imposition of a minimum wage in Britain and most recently in uh, Germany didn't find large job losses if there were any losses at all. So I would say the evidence is pretty mixed, but I think the, the senator has a point that in the case of South Dakota, which is a low wage state, uh -huh. uh, a $15 minimum is a pretty big increase from where they are now. And it might not be that you can learn uh, precisely what would happen in South Dakota from the historical experience. On the question of immigration, again, looking at the work that's been done and whether or not the, the, the value of immigration, the work you have been doing into all of these areas is fundamental to these that's core ways of life, aren't, isn't it? Well, it's, a, I yeah, think it's I know, a, one part of an understanding of first of all, how immigrants fit into the labor market. Secondly, yeah. whether um, yeah. their arrival has some un un um, unanticipated or um, possibly harmful effects on natives. And th those are always um, first order questions that people want to know about. What do you do now? I mean, where do you go having got this great honor and distinction and, and a, a, a chunk of change that comes with it but that's but that's that's sort of the, the, comes along the side what do you do next or carry on um i'm continuing to do projects you know as similar kinds of projects in in different areas um pretty much the same as i was doing yesterday the big with that in mind and bearing in mind we're coming out of a pandemic that seems to have caused seismic shifts in economics, in the way our workplace, in the way we interact in, in, in the work. What do you think are the big issues for economics as it relates to the workplace in the future? Uh, I think the pandemic has really brought forward the issue of um, uh, work from home. Uh, how many workers will be able to work from home? Um, will it be 80% or only 50%. Um, secondly, how will they be paid? Right now, uh, workers that work in high cost areas, for instance, if you work in San Francisco, you would typically get a premium over somebody that's uh, working in uh, Colorado. Um, if everyone's working from home, those premiums will have to all be uh, rearranged. It'll be really interesting to see how that's gonna work out. And that's exactly what is happening, isn't it? The Googles of this world, uh, the PwCs, those people who have agreed to let people move or work from home have said, oh, yeah, but you can't keep your extra way. You can't keep your extra pay for those. Ones. Which, of course, makes sense and sort of seems unfair at one and the same time. Yeah, you can understand both sides, I think. Uh, it's the typical thing in economics. There's always uh, two sides to uh, to an argument. And, and here it seems like, you know, Google is was previously paying a, a, a reward to live in a high-cost area. And if you're not doing that, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't uh, expect that to be in your pay. I can see that. Well, judging from where you are at the moment, you're certainly familiar with the high cost of living in certain parts of that northern California. Professor, congratulations once again, and thank you. I much appreciate the important work that you've done on, on all these issues. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Um, 
Let me just make sure. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> there's some interesting points with that uh, interview that we may want to talk about. Uh, they sometimes refer to economists as sort of Hindu gods with many, many hands. On one hand is this, on the other hand is that. And uh, the more uh, he mentioned two sides, there usually are multiple sides in economic policy. But uh, that has nothing to do directly with the uh, Nobel Prizes here. I want to talk about the other two. Uh, th this, th their fields are a little more abstruse. Joshua David Angrist is an Israeli American born in 1960. Uh, and it includes economics of education and school reform. And social programs, labor markets, and the effects of immigration. Very similar topics to what Dr. Card, Card uh, David Card, covers. Um, notice econ econometric methods for program and policy evaluation, tricky stuff. Similar to his research on the economics of education, Angrist's research on labor economics also often seeks to exploit quasi-natural experiments to identify causal relationships. And he's presently at MIT. Now, the, uh, this, uh, this is a little different. This is going to be the telephone call he gets uh, uh, from Sweden at uh, early morning. And he's, in, um, he's at MIT, so East Coast. But still, it's 5 in the morning in the East Coast. It's 2 in the morning in California which will begin, bring our third laureate uh, in, in a little while. So this is a transcription or a recording uh, of that phone call made by, of all people, Adam Smith, I think is the name. Anyway, let's listen to it. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, am I speaking with Joshua Angrist? Yes, speaking. Hello, this is Adam Smith uh, from Nobel Prize. Hey, Adam. Hi. Great uh, name, great name. <laughs> <laughs> many, many congratulations. You've heard that before. Yes. <laughs> I hear it particularly on this day of the Nobels. Um, it, the, 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 <laughs> many, many congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I'm honored. I'm thrilled. Yeah, so how did you actually discover that you had been awarded the prize in economic sciences? Uh, well, I woke up... Uh, early in the morning for no particular uh, good reason. And I saw that my phone was uh, flooded with uh, text messages. And I had had it off uh, because I was uh, not expecting anything special this morning. So I um, had to look at the phone. And then uh, I tried to find the phone number that I should call to uh, figure out if it was true. And so you came through to Stockholm to the Nobel Foundation offices. Uh, actually, I called someone at MIT who had called me. And so, so you spoke to someone uh, who confirmed it. Yes, our press office. Right. Okay. Great. Given that you're in the business of collecting evidence for causal causal <laughs> relationships, <laughs> yeah, you wanted to be certain. Of yes, it. I wanted to be sure. Yes, I didn't. I didn't really expect it. I suppose everybody says that, and you're supposed to say that. But I think in my case, uh, my lack of preparation is evidence that I didn't expect it. So, how does it feel to have received it? Uh, it's wonderful. It's overwhelming. Um, it's you know, it's the beginning of. Uh, of the day here in the United States, and I'm trying to absorb it. I am especially happy to be grouped with uh, Dave Card and Hito Imbens, who are uh, certainly worthy. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky to have been able to work with them and mm. learn from them. Because mm. you were you were David Card's student for a while, were you? Yes. Well, I, I was uh, one of his graduate students. I had three wonderful advisors, but... Uh, uh, he surely had a huge influence on me and my development as an empiricist. And then Hugh you Invins know, was one of my first uh, collaborators. And we embarked on a path of uh, methodological work that proved to be very rewarding to us and, and influential. What was it about that relationship in the early 90s that kind of spawned those papers? What was special about the combination of the two of you? Well, we enjoyed working together, and we found that we uh, were interested in the same kind of problems. We were both assistant professors at Harvard. I had been there for one year, 
Uh, Ido came in the second year, and then I left after that, actually. I moved back to Israel, uh, where I taught for five years uh, and um, at Ibri University. But Ido and I kept collaborating, and we we had started on something um, that we thought was interesting and important. I guess we didn't really quite know how important. Uh, and we set out to kind of figure out what instrumental variables which is the statistical technique that Ido and I have studied together most closely, uh, what we really learned from that. It was based in part on my applications, and then uh, it developed with his theoretical insights. And we kind of went back and forth between uh, you know, applied questions and methodological questions and came up with a whole framework. People, people today call it the late framework. In the beginning, it was it was one paper, and then that paper didn't get published, and then it was the second paper that did get published, and and then it it developed further. Mm. And I mean, your work is all about um, finding the basis for people's beliefs, if you like. So, can you give me an example of, for instance, in education, something that is a popularly held belief that actually is not supported by evidence that you found? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, Adam. Um, I don't know if my work is about people's beliefs, but it's about, you know, people can believe what they want to believe, but it, it is about discovering what is true in the sense of, is there a causal effect of something? In other words, if you did a particular thing, uh, maybe related to education, what would happen to you? Mm. Or it might my phone is uh, going off there. <laughs> the uh, a great question of that is something that uh, many people believe, for example, that highly selective public high schools uh, or highly selective universities are the key to a successful career, uh, especially in my world where we work in such institutions on the university end. And uh, what I've been able to show using some of the techniques developed in the uh, work with Hito and and in the training that I had with Dave Card is that that's often illusory. It it's reflects a phenomenon we call selection bias, that people who go to those schools tend to do well in life, but they were going to do well in life anyway. That's how they got into the schools. Okay. Mm. Uh, so that's a great example of selection bias. And the techniques that, that all three of us have worked on are about reducing or mitigating selection bias in empirical estimates and using uh, mostly observed data to get at the kind of evidence that we would like to have, say, from a randomized trial. I would like to talk much more about this, but your phone buzzing is going to be the, the, the story of the day, really, isn't it? <laughs> yes. What would be very nice is if we could have a longer conversation when things quiet down a bit for you, although I think it will be a, quite a little time before things do quiet down. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I don't know. You sound pretty... You sound pretty together and calm at the moment. <laughs> oh, I like to talk about my work, um, so uh, that always calms me down. I, I think I hear a coffee cup rattling there as well, maybe. Yeah, that's... have a little coffee here. Well, that's an, important, that's an important constituent of the day, I think. I shall let you get on with your day. Good luck with it. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Congratulations. Thank, thank you so much, Ed. Bye-bye. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> We won't go through that again. Um, so he's been referring uh, repeatedly to Guido, uh, but I just want to call attention to the use of the, his self-identity self as an ex empiricist, uh, which is the essence of these prizes this year, and uh, distinguishing between belief and truth. I think that's interesting. The last winner is uh, Guido Wilhelmus Imbens, at first, I thought he was Italian, but he's Dutch American, and uh, born in 1963. I, I I think it's so fascinating that each of the three winners are hyphenated Americans uh, because of the attraction uh, to, uh, to of this country to um, uh, to um, scientists and to uh, uh, academicians, etc. So he focused on developing the same methodologies uh, that our previous winner had using real life situations. And they call them natural experiments. And uh, 
I know John Axe is here with us today and the, the dis, whether we agree their experiments or not, they do have ways of, of uh, parsing it out and, and uh, using high level mathematics and statistics to, to determine these, uh, the impact uh, of economic policy on a variety of variables. He is at Stanford University. Now, uh, this is the last of the videos and it's a really interesting uh, video that I wanna show you because basically it's produced by uh, Stanford University and it has his three children aged from around 16 to nine going down, each one of them talking to their father, the, no, the laureate, and as he explains what he does. And so uh, let's look at that and then we can talk a little bit about, it. okay. Uh, my name is Carlton Imbens. That's, oh, it's Pop, again, Pop, can you? Su Susan, can you take my phone actually? From what I understand. Either it's like where you are famous. <laughs> let's say, I wanna understand. From what I understand, you take data and you kind of run your own experiments without actually running an experiment. Like you, you can take data and use it as if it, it was your experiment. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of, you know, in a lot of cases when we try to get the, the answer to important questions, we do experiments. When they try to figure out if the vaccines for COVID were working, they did all sorts of experiments. But in a lot of cases uh, in economics, you can't do experiments. You kind of just doesn't work. We, can, we can't say, well, you go to school and we're going to have this whole other set of kids and they're not allowed to go to school. Yeah. So, so that kind of, that wouldn't work. And so we need to kind of try to tease out those things from, from data where people just make their choices and kind of do what they, they want to do. And so we kind of try to come up with clever ways of still teasing out these effects. Uh, the, and so you might like use like behavior things or- well, so kind of yeah. What I've done is, is a lot of the methodology kind of so trying to help people understand exactly how these methods, these things work and giving them better methods for, for doing these things. And so another study that, that one of the, my friends who won the prize with me, uh, George Angris did, was he, won, he was interested in the effect of getting more schooling, getting more education on earnings. And he used the fact that compulsory schooling laws change a little bit. Uh, so if you're born on September 30th, you need to go to school earlier and if you're born on October 1st, because it doesn't really make you a different person, but it makes you get, on average, get a little bit more schooling. And so kind of he used that as an instrument, kind of as a way of, of teasing apart the correlation and the causality. And he could see from there that the people who kind of, we stayed in school just a little bit longer, found out that they were actually having higher income later. It's very interesting Thank you. how you can take uh, like data from like things that were completely like not like not intended for you yeah. for anything, and then and then use it to, to draw these like astounding conclusions. I'm Andrew Inbens. Uh, spelling of my first name is A N D R E W. Uh, I'm gonna assume my last name is <laughs> it's the same as mine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, so congratulations! Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a very exciting morning. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I was wondering about some of the applications of what you've been doing because you know, we've talked about like what tens of like what it is but so what what might you well yeah so so you know kind of in general we were interested in what would be you know for social policy it's kind of important to know what would happen if you give everybody some guaranteed income what would that do to a society what would these would people still try to look for a job or would they kind of just be happy to sit at home because you can't do an experiment there, you could look at uh, people who play the lottery, because then some of those people are going to win some big amount of money. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like having a basic income. In fact, kind of when we, the lottery we looked at in Massachusetts, if you win half a million dollars, you would get a check for half a million dollars. You would get a check for $25,000 every year for 20 years. So it's kind of very much like having a guaranteed income. We kind of looked at what happened to them. Did they stop working? Did mm -hmm. they retire early? Or did they keep working? And it turned out 
most of the people really just kept working. It was kind of very nice for them to win the lottery, but it didn't really change what uh, what they did. It helps kind of inform public policy, and it kind of and it gives you a credible way of looking at uh, what the effect is of having having some income, which would be very hard to do than otherwise. All right, so. <laughs> I'm a little interested in making sure that I understand this. So you know, if I have to explain it, I, I know my stuff. Let's say I want to understand whether not having homework for math specifically makes people enjoy it more. And so I've, I've got my school. Yeah, you could well imagine that that would be the case. Right, yeah, exactly. I don't like homework. I do like math. I don't have math homework. Maybe they're correlated. So my school uh, advertises itself for kids who love math, and they don't have math homework since we need more data than just that. We'll look at the other schools in my area, uh, Palo Alto High School and, and Gunn High School, both also take from the same batch of students in, in the, the you know, Bay Area, and they do have math homework. What you're saying is that I can't just take a bunch of students from proof school and a bunch of students from Gunn and ask who enjoys math more. We need a better test group. And so what you're saying is that I should go to Gunn and Palo Alto High School, and I should find students who not only applied to proof, but gotten into proof, that they're, they're clearly kids who could have gone to proof school, but didn't, and now have math homework. Yeah, and so, so you kind of could also look at kids who kind of didn't go to proof, but were really interested in math, but it was kind of too long a commute, so they lived far away from the train station, and it would have been a long bike ride or long drive to the train station, but otherwise they would have gone. And obviously living far away from the train station is probably not really correlated. It has nothing to do with liking math or not. You wouldn't expect so, it to it. Yeah, and so, and kind of more generally, there's a lot of cases where you have you want to compare these two groups, but you're worried about them being different in lots in other ways. And kind of you look for these these small things that make people that change the incentives uh, a little bit, but a bit, that do not have anything to do with who they are or what their preferences are. Right. So so it all sort of boils down to if you want to know whether thing A has an effect on people, you compare really similar people. Like you yeah. want to, you want to make them as similar as possible in all the ways except for thing A. Yeah, and all, and you kind of use these instruments to kind of change this incentives to be in one group rather than the other. Things that that people don't have choice over, so that yes, exactly. it's, it's like a randomized study. Yeah, exactly, and so for the, that small group, it is it becomes like a randomized study. It becomes like an experiment. You get the benefits of an experiment without actually having to run an experiment. So um, uh, next week we're going to. I'll open to questions and we can talk about things. But next week we're going to talk about the new Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, a short history of that special prize. It's not as special as the economics prize, but it is. It's it's quite different from the other four prizes. And um, and we'll talk about the laureates themselves. So with that. I'm going to uh, get back to you all. And uh, first of all, I want to know if, if that was informative to you all. Uh, so you can all unmute yourselves now if you want. And uh, to me, I learned a great deal uh, without having to go into calculus. Uh, I, I sat in on a, uh, I'm on the Graduate Teaching Awards Committee and I, <laughs> I sat in on an economics class for first year uh, economics uh, using calculus. And even at that simple level, it, it was amazing what could be done. Uh, this is far more advanced uh, statistics and, and mathematics that are applied here. And notice none of them, there was a little picture of a blackboard in one of the earlier videos, but they don't talk about the actual technique, but they can talk about the consequences. So, first of all, yeah, was it useful to you? Yes, Ron. Uh, John, I'd just like to say, um, I know that when you put these programs together, um, you're usually looking for a, a speaker uh, someone on the faculty or someone who knows the subject and then bring them in to talk about the prize. Uh, right. But I think uh, what you did today in terms of finding these 
sources, you know, is uh, the real people speaking. Um, I think it was really excellent. And I think we, um, um, we really got a lot out of it. I, it was, it's a good job putting it together. Thanks. I, I, you know, the whole point is my curiosity uh, leads to these things. I want to know something about something or other. And in the past, I've usually had to pick up usually literature because the English department, as large as it is at this university, is very resistant to giving talks. Uh, they're kind of a cynical group of people, not all of them, but some mm -hmm. of them. But uh, so this time, you know, I, if I had to do it on physics or, or you know, of chemistry, I, <laughs> I'd I'd be really lost. But uh, what's an amazing now is the resources we have available to us, uh, both on YouTube and other sources, uh, 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 and, and the NobelPrize.org, uh, tremendous resources of the foundation itself uh, yeah. in, uh, in, in Stockholm. And we'll talk more about that some other time. Uh, I just to, I want to mention one or two other words. Um, selection bias. I was amused. E economics. I I just uh, is I can such a weaselly field. <laughs> so this was at least uh, ap applied economics. I thought that was really interesting in itself, and uh, and how they kind of at least disprove all our beliefs, uh, or at least test them in some way. Yeah, this sort of thing. Um, uh, so uh, what accent was that person speaking in? It was uh, a strange, I, it must be at, uh, from the Antipodes or somewhere. There's a, almost a little bit of South African in there too, I, I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, so, well, I just, uh, thank you, Ron. I think we may try one of some of these more diverse things. And I discovered how to incorporate uh, YouTube uh, without going to YouTube in PowerPoint. If anybody wants to know how to do it, I'll tell you. I do. You're going to have to teach that to me. I will. Madeline, does. Madeline knows. Um, um, I think Ken Byrne has a, Ken Byrne. Well, I would, I would say that uh, you're correct. Going to the original source is very satisfying at times. I, mm -hmm. In uh, our course on genetic modification, uh, we had uh, uh, Jennifer Dowden explain about uh, gene editing. And while it still was complex, I can guarantee you her presentation was a lot more uh, understandable uh, than most others would have had to uh, offer us. So I think that works. Sometimes I think it isn't perfect. And it all depends on the videos that you speak. Last summer, or maybe the summer before, uh, I took a couple of uh, videos from Hopkins on uh, on uh, the virus and COVID by experts at Hopkins. Uh, and I thought that was informative. Uh, the people were unable to be understood very clearly. And uh, so I think, it, I think it worked well. I think that uh, when you're doing it and we're doing these talks by Zoom, it's very effective. Yeah. What we're going to try to do in come in the fall is that we're really going back to live classes. And in fact, we may not uh, want to continue with the hybrid format for a variety of reasons. Right. So under those conditions, it's going to be somewhat more challenging, uh, although you can do it. Well, and we can still use PowerPoint in in person. Right, right, we have exactly. Good, good screens now, and it, and that that does. And in fact, that's that's what we did yeah. in some instances. Right. But I, I, the only problem I had is that, that we were talking about the X, and I had a little trouble following 
completely. I got individual words with no problem, but getting the overall gist of what the sentence was yeah. in some instances, I found to be a little challenging. And I don't know whether that's our sound system or the speaker yeah. or what it is, but it uh, it made it a little little more difficult. I thought the CNN guy, uh, who I think must be English, although I'm not positive of that, the, the interview. Yes. I, I forget his name, but anyway, He's very easy to understand, although his accent is amusing. Yeah. But some of these people are, are more difficult. They're so, all, yeah, putting a sense. They, they, they add their own uh, kind of editorial comments to all of it to keep, <clears throat> to keep the audience engrossed or something. I thought choosing child, his children to interview him was so endearing. <laughs> and if he could explain it to his 10 year old or whatever, uh, well, it's, you know, you don't know the level of his kids, but I would say that since you're dealing with kids, I would classify it as courageous because <laughs> you're not quite sure what's going to come. That was my favorite part as a fourth grade teacher. I loved it. <laughs> I did too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next week, I, I uh, maybe I'll find some cute things, but we're going to be dealing with the actual. Um, the I, I don't know if peace under the current conditions is it going to be a wonderful topic since well we're suffering one of one of the laureates actually has uh, had his whole operation shut down by putin uh, so it's it's interesting there and we have some, some news reports that are relevant there too so that could could be interesting as as well yeah so good we'll see you next week thank Again, you john for rescuing yeah. This court. <laughs> well, it rescued it for me. I wanted to know something. So it forced me to dive in. You know, I was going to just sit back and listen to the expert. But, um, and the experts, as you know, some like Perich has this ability to talk to, the, to us uh, and bring us in to it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I thought, uh, you know, what my nine. Bill, I've forgotten his last name, who talked about the uh, pain receptors and the heat receptors were oh, excellent. Yeah. excellent. Oh, yeah. So it's a very, it, you know, it takes, uh, the, you have to know the audience and, and, uh, and it, I, I do find it's much easier to talk about literature because it is very subjective and Apollo did that very well. Um, uh, but uh, some of the technical things, if they're really abstract uh it's tricky to bring everybody along so uh, yeah well we've had as you i think suggested far and away the most difficulty with physics yeah and, yeah true. the only thing i would say from the point of view of the science subcommittee is that the only topic that's more challenging for us is mathematics <laughs> it's hard to get mathematicians to relate to us normal folk <laughs> and physicists are somewhere just slightly there's a wonderful us. joke it says you can tell uh uh a, a uh, how did it go a a uh, uh, a mathematician who has communication skills because uh, when he talks to you he doesn't look at his uh, shoes so uh something to that effect <laughs> <laughs> a criticism of mathematicians. Bob. Yeah, know. I just wanted to say something. I think it's kind of funny. When I worked at the Osteopathic Medical School, one of my jobs was being a translator. And it was not from another language. It was from medicine to English. And I would take the papers that the that the people were try, going to give in it conferences and they had to give them to me personally you know they had to present it and then I had to help them translate the first you know after a while I just said first before you even talk I need to see the paper you know give me the paper and I'll tell you what to say and because some of them were they were terrible I mean it, there was just absolutely no way that the the audience they was going to give it to would understand what they had to say. Other ones were excellent, but I was the translator. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. There's a, there's a joke. Yeah. But the definition of an utter disaster is a busload of mathematicians going over a cliff and there's one empty seat. Oh, terrible. Nasty, nasty. But oh. it, was told, it was told by a very well-known scientist. I didn't hear the punchline. There was one. Now, there's one empty seat. So they wasted an opportunity to get rid of yet another mathematician. <laughs> Sounds like a lawyer joke turned yeah, to right. mathematician. We have lots of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks again. Thank Great you, job, John. Thank you so much. We'll look Thank forward you. to seeing everyone next week. Yeah. Bye. Bye.